Okay, I'm going to show you from the scriptures that post tribbers need to be saved. We're going to start out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. A lot of people try to say that the timing of the catching up of the body of Christ is not a salvation issue. Oh, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely is a salvation issue. And if you believe that it's not really that important and whatever else, uh, you need to check yourself. It is a major salvation issue. And if you're a post-trib, uh, you need to be saved. Just as simple as that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, reading down to verse 10. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Patience of hope? Do you say people have patience of hope? Yeah, we're looking for Jesus Christ. We're not looking for the Antichrist. But if you're a postie, that's what I'm going to call you, you're looking for the Antichrist. You're not looking for Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's not your Savior. Oh, he saved me from hell. Yeah, but he won't save you from his judgment and wrath that comes on the wicked lost world. You need to be saved. Verse 4, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God... But you don't have that if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble and you take the mark. We'll talk about that more as we continue. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Do you have assurance if you're going to go into the time when you could take the mark and lose your salvation? No, you don't have assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You don't have that. If you're a postie, you don't have that. You don't know for sure. You're going into a time when God removes peace from the earth. And you're going to be facing his judgment and his wrath with the lost world that's rejected Jesus Christ. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Oh, the church is, you think that you're going to give up in the pre-trib rapture and it, the church is, we're due for suffering. Um, if you haven't received any suffering, if you haven't received the word in much affliction, if you haven't had friends turn against you and job loss and, and, and health issues and whatever else, you're not saved. You receive the word in much affliction when you get saved. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Everything changes. And if you're saying, well, we haven't been persecuted yet, uh, I hate to tell you, Bible-believing Christians get persecuted all the time. Every, every single year of church history, we get persecuted. Oh, I haven't seen that. Then I suggest you get saved. Verse 7, So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia, Mas yeah, Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God, turned to God, hmm, from idols to serve the living and true God. There's a lot of devils out there that are saying you don't need to turn to God now. You don't need to repent. You don't need to have a changed life. You can look like the world, act like the world, cuss like the world, drink like the world, watch what the world does with television, movies, and things like that, and you're fine. You're a Christian. I don't think so. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's not talking about hell and eternity. It's talking about God's wrath that comes on a world that rejects Jesus Christ. He delivers us from the wrath to come. So I don't believe that. I'm going to go into it. Then you're not saved. You have a false God. Every single dispensation that's out there, God always removes the righteous before he judges the wicked. Always. Hey, Noah, get on the boat. I'm going to save you and judge the lost world. Hey, Lot, get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah until you're gone. Over and over and over and over again. Except for now in the body of Christ. Now that we are part of Christ's body, somehow we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. So Jesus is going to be pouring out judgment and wrath on himself? 
Saved people don't believe that way. Lost people do. If you're a post-tribber, you're lost. I've been dealing with these people for years and years and years before any other issue, including the Bible version issue. It's, what, 12 years now I've been dealing? Since 2007? Been dealing with these post-tribbers? They're lost people. Yes, it is a salvation issue. Absolutely. John chapter 10. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 10. People say all these little all these little excuses to convince yourself and other people that you're going to go into a time when you're going to be facing God's ju judgment and wrath. Then you play little word games. Well, the word wrath doesn't really show up until the later end of the part of the, the, the Great Tribulation. <laughs> uh, okay, well, you th what do you think him releasing the Antichrist on the world is going to be? That starts the whole thing. That's not judgment. That's not wrath. The Antichrist goes out conquering and to conquer. That's not wrath. Keep playing little word games, okay? All it does is just prove that you're lost. You're not looking to Jesus Christ to save you from the wrath to come. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. The catching up, in other words. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. It's not the same thing as the second coming, in other words. Verse 7. Then said Jesus again unto th un excuse me, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. What does John see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1? He sees a door open in heaven. Verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. In at the rapture. Out at the second coming. We come back down with Jesus Christ. And what do we do when we come back? We find pasture. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Coming in, and it's going to be an agrarian world at that point in time. Ruling and reigning with Christ. Verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what post-tribbers are. I did a, 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 a message many, many years ago, 2009. I did this, this sermon called uh, Post-Trib Rapture Thieves. And I say, what do they do? They steal. They kill. They destroy. They steal things that God has written to the Jews. They kill your joy. And they destroy your rewards. I think is how I had it back then. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you have abundant life when you're looking and saying, we're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble? The Antichrist is coming. We're probably going to get our heads cut off. See, what about the martyrs? What about the martyrs? Uh, I don't think it was God that was killing the martyrs. You wicked, stupid papists, you. Uh, God never killed any of the martyrs. That was a Catholic church. God is the one who's bringing the Antichrist on this earth. Why? To punish the Jews for rejecting him. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. A little dense there. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Let's see where am I reading to here? The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep, like most pastors in America. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jewish disciples. And Jesus is giving a little foresight here into the, into the church age, if you want to call it that, where the body of Christ is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must... 
uh, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Huh. This is before the crucifixion. Okay. Very interesting. One fold. We're going to see that as we continue. John chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. Okay, here's Jesus, and he's there with, with you know, Lazarus has died and, and, and things. Look at this. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Okay? Look what Jesus says to her. You see, what is the rapture really in, in reality? It's the resurrection. Again, we're going to see that as we continue in the study. It is the resurrection. You say, well, the timing of that resurrection really doesn't matter. That's the words of a lost person. Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. You deny the pre-trib rapture, you're denying Jesus Christ. Why? There is no resurrection of dead saints at the second coming. Matthew 24, Mark 30, 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, where is there any dead saints coming up? It's not there. You say, well, that's when we're going to be raptured. That's when we're going to be raptured. Oh, really? Okay, then you're denying Jesus Christ. Let me show you. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Not in Matthew 24. There's no dead saints coming up. Verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Hmm. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Another little interesting thing that the Lord puts right into the text there. He comes secretly and he comes and he calls and she arises and comes to him. But you're not going to get that if you're a post-tribber. You're just going to say, oh, you're stretching the text. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because you're lost. You're lost. Supernatural, miraculous things don't make sense to you because you're yet in your sins. Ephesians chapter 1. You want the greatest passage on the uh, catching up of the body of Christ? This is it. Ephesians chapter 1. I'll show you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 through 14. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on, are on earth, even in him. There shall be one fold, one flock. Huh. Those things which are in heaven, the dead saints that have gone on before, and those which are on earth, living saints. Verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We're predestinated. I am part of the body of Christ. I'm a member of the body of Christ, and I can't get out of that. Verse 12, That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? Then how in the world can you go into a time where you could take the mark and lose your salvation? How in the world could you believe something so ridiculous? Uh, it's probably because you're lost as a post-tribber. Why would you fight? I mean, it doesn't even make any sense to me. Jesus saved me from hell, but he's not going to save me from his wrath on the earth. I'm going to be judged. You have a false God. I still stand by my statement. Post-tribbers have a false God. But look at verse 14. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. The redemption of the purchased possession. When does that happen? You say, well, that's when you get saved. He redeems you with his, with his blood. That's not what it's talking about here. That's when he pays the price. But when you go up, that's the redemption of the purchased possession. And how do you know? Unto the praise of his glory. What do you think we're going to do when we actually get up there in the clouds and we see him for the first time? We're going to praise him. 
unless you're a post-tribber. Then you'd be disappointed. You'd say, oh, I really wanted to go into that time there and suffer a bit because I was going to prove how good a Christian I am. I think the church needs to be purified. Okay, Catholic, why don't you just start whipping yourself like the Catholic monks and priests do? Self-flagellation to put down the flesh. Bunch of stinking papists. And the Catholic Church, by the way, has always been post-trib. Let me just add that little thing in there. That's what most post-tribbers are. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. You say, well, I think you should have more grace. Nope. No grace. No grace for post-tribbers. You've had enough over the years. If you're still post-trib after all this time, after all the videos that are out there, my preaching and others that have, have just, just totally destroyed this whole post-trib thing, if you're still post-trib, you are most definitely lost. And I would say your heart is very close to being hardened. All right? But you want to believe in your little God that's going to put you into His judgment and His wrath because you're righteous to make you more righteous. You wicked, self-righteous hypocrite, you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 through 19. Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Jesus is the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the resurrection? You say, well, yes, it'll be at the end. There's no resurrection of dead saints at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not there. You see what I'm saying? Verse 15. Uh, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. In this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Uh, how about it there, Posty? Where's your joy lie? Are you looking forward to the future? I am. You know why? Because I'm going to get to see Jesus. There's going to come a day when I'm finally going to hear my name called and I'm going to look it up and I'm going to see the door open and it's going to be, bye-bye, wicked world. I'm done with you. My suffering and my pers all the persecution and everything I've endured and all the hardships and pain and everything else, it's over. That's what I'm looking forward to. But you, if you're a postie, what are you looking forward to? The new world order? The Antichrist? The mark of the beast? Oh, look, look, children, God's wrath is being poured out. Isn't this wonderful? We're being purified. <laughs> really? Really? Hey, God promises us peace in all the Pauline epistles. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> second seal opened. Peace is taken from the earth. Well, Dad, I thought the, I thought your, the Bible says that God gives us peace, but here it says he took it away. How does that work? Well, it's okay, son, because we're, we're post-tribbers. And don't worry, this is his love for us. You know, hey, look, war and the Antichrist showing up and all these other horrible things. It's, it's peace from God, apparently. You people are so lost. I mean, my word. I had way too much grace for post-tribbers in the past. Again, I will apologize here publicly before God and man and say my mistake in the past of saying I think some post-tribbers are saved. Uh, no, I'm not going to make that mistake anymore. Um, the truth has been out now for long enough. You, you should have been able to find it. The Holy Spirit would direct you to it. See, the thing that separates us from the lost world is the Holy Spirit of truth, revealing truth, not your feelings. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Why is Paul talking about dead saints and resurrection? We shall not all sleep. Huh. Um, and hey, Paul, aren't you, you know, isn't Paul a little stupid here? Behold, I show you a mystery. No, Paul, it's been written about before. The second coming and things like that. Uh, it, it's, it's clearly revealed, the second coming. Yeah, we're you know, going to go through the tribulation and whatever else. You know? No? 
the resurrection is what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have that victory if you're a post-tribber. You don't have any victory. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11 says, if you take the mark, you get God's wrath. And yet 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, if any provide not for his own, especially for they have his own, own of his own house, excuse me, uh, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. How can you provide for your own if you can't buy or sell? So Paul, writing to Timothy there in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says you need to provide for your own. Revelation 13 says that you're required to take the mark. False prophets going to cause all to take the mark, essentially. Um, worship the beast in his image. And Revelation 14 says if you do, you, you get God's wrath and you go to hell forever and ever. How do you reconcile those things? You don't. You know why? Because Christians can't go into that time period. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I already read these verses, but we'll go over them again. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yes, it is. Absolutely, it's, it is completely in vain in the Lord if you're a post-tribber. Why? Uh, well, here you're working, you're trying to provide for your own and everything else. Antichrist shows up, guess what's going to happen to your property and everything else? <laughs> Confiscated. Oh, uh, I have to provide for my own, so i got to go out and i got to take this mark. Oops, now i got God's wrath and judgment. Was your labor in vain? Yes. But you see, as a believer in the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, my labor is not in vain because there's going to come a day when all the stuff that I've done and whatever else that I've done for the Lord, guess what? I'm leaving it. I'm leaving this earth down here and the things I've done for the Lord, I'll say it that way, I go up. I'm laying up treasures in heaven. I don't have to worry about it being taken from me. There's not one thing I can do in this life right now that's going to cause me to be out of Jesus Christ. To, it's going to cause me to lose my salvation. Not one thing. But you can't say that if you're a post-tribber, can you? Hmm. You need to be saved if you're a post-tribber. You say, well, I'm saved. I'm just a little confused on this issue. Uh, really? When you came to Jesus Christ, did you really trust him for everything? Or is there just some little holdouts? You know, well, I think he saved me from hell, but... I don't know if he's possible, you know, if it's possible for him to save me from the judgment that he's going to bring on this earth. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Next we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. A little hard to turn here today. Kind of windy. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Huh. Um, there's that dead saints being resurrected again. Hmm. Uh, true for a member of the body of Christ, but not true for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. There are no dead saints that come up during that time of Jacob's trouble. Show it to me. Show it to me in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, or the book of Revelation. Show me where dead saints come up. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. When? Let's keep reading. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he brings them with them. They're in heaven. Their souls are in heaven. And he brings them with him. And the dead in Christ rise. Their dead bodies rise. They're changed. They're made incorruptible. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The next supernatural being that you're going to see is Jesus Christ, if you're saved. You're not going to see the Antichrist. Oh, but I know brother so-and-so, and he's saying that we're not going to go through the tribulation, but we're going to see the Antichrist. Uh, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Does somebody escape this time that's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble? Yes, absolutely. Somebody escapes this time that's coming. The other people, the lost world is saying, peace and safety, and I think you know things could get better here and whatever. They don't escape. Sudden destruction comes upon them. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. I mean, you know, again, it cracks me up. I see people that are, that are you know, Believing in the time of Jacob's, or the, the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, the pre trib rapture, if you want to say it that way. And we're looking and we're saying, oh man, it's just got to be close. It just, I could, you just feel it. Oh, wow. And posties are going, yeah, whatever. Let's go out to eat. Let's go out to the movies. Let's go and let's, let's take a vacation here. We're planning on expanding our church and we're doing blah, 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 you know, worldly, completely worldly. They're in darkness. Verse 5, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. Are you, are you watching and being sober right now as a Christian? I am. Looking at the economy, looking at war and all these other things and thinking, wow, we got to be getting close. But posties? Nope. I'm a prepper. I'm going to be an end time prepper. I'm going to get through the seven years because I'm prepping. And I got, I got seven cases of MREs now. You know, <laughs> you know, meals rejected by everyone. In other words, no, that's not what it means. But, you know, this terrible junk food, you know, Jim Baker buckets and all this other stuff that float and just a bunch of junk. You're not watching. You're not being sober. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a post-tribber, you need to get saved. You're not saved. Verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as, ye also, even as also ye do. Comfort. Now, you can't tell me that if you're a post-tribber, you are not looking towards the future with comfort. You're not saying, I'm going to see Jesus. I can't wait to that day when I'm going to see him. You're not looking for Jesus. And it's so funny, too, because just another way to prove how wicked these people are, every single post-tribber is a wicked lost devil. I'm going to tell you that right now. Why? Guess what? Lost people are afraid of judgment. When you understand that, hey, I'm, I'm going to be a post-tribber, you are now setting yourself up to know the timing of the catching up. Or the, I should say the timing of, of the the. Return of Jesus Christ, okay? If you say, full on, I'm a post-tribber the whole way through, okay? Antichrist shows up, you say, okay, I got approximately seven years before I have to get right. You see? I'm not going to see Jesus for at least seven years. If you're post-trib, pre-wrath, whatever, you know, 
stupid nonsense, mid-trib. If you're that, then you got three and a half years. You can time out how much time you have left before you see Jesus Christ. So if there's some things that you're doing that, you know, I probably shouldn't be doing these, but hey, I don't have to see Jesus for at least seven years or three and a half years, depending on which one you are. But you see, as a Christian that is pre-trib, well, you can see Jesus anytime. It's going to clean up your life. You're going to live differently than a post-tribber. And a lot of these post-trib systems, too, it's so ironic because they remove the judgment seat of Christ. We go into this time of, of great tribulation, and we're there, and we're enduring to the end to be saved, and we get through the whole thing, second coming, go up, right back down again, and right into the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. What about the judgment seat of Christ? You mean to tell me you're a, uh, <coughs> a Christian, and you don't want to be judged by Jesus? Uh-oh. <laughs> That's a problem. Next, we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, down through verse 17. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. People come up with all kinds of stupid nonsense. Oh, well, it's the Antichrist, and he, you know, he is assassinated, and he he comes back as nonsense, absolute nonsense. He who now letteth will let. What's that? The Holy Spirit until he be taken out of the way, the body of Christ, and then shall that wicked be revealed, the Antichrist. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, and signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You know what you are as a post-tribber? You are somebody who has not received the love of the truth. Why? Because you have pleasure in unrighteousness. You don't want to give up the uh, worldly ways and all the other things. The thought of uh, leaving at any minute, imminent catching up of the body of Christ, that's repulsive to you as a post-tribber. You'd have to leave behind all your preps and all your other things and, and all your uh, whatever. You haven't had enough of the world, have you? Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God, God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Huh. Whereunto he called you by, we, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Stand your ground. Okay? Don't be like the posties. Well, I once was pre-trib. I used to be pre-trib. I used to look for Jesus, but then I realized the truth. That it was John Nelson Darby that brought it in and blah, 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 you know. And I'm looking for the Antichrist now. I'm a much, much better strong Christian because I'm looking for the Antichrist. And I'm looking for the New World Order. And then I'll get to know when Jesus is coming back so I can live like the devil until that day. You need to be saved. You're not saved if you're post-trib. Romans chapter 1. You're so angry. You just have such an anger problem. You've been hurt in the past, and now you're taking that on people. Blah, blah. Or I could actually be trying to warn you. If you're post-trib, you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ. You are believing in a God that is going to punish you with the wicked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham says to God, back there before he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, if I find ten righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you spare it? God says, yeah, I'll do that. He did it back then, but he's not going to do it today. When people are part of his own body. Makes no sense. Only a lost person would believe a thing like that. That the body of Christ would go into a time where God's wrath is going to be poured out on 
his own body. It's insanity. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 19. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by sight, because you can see when the Antichrist shows up, then we know, no, it says the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all saved people who are part of the body. Oh, again, it doesn't say that. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all Christians because the church needs to be purified. No, it doesn't say that, papists. It does not say that. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. If you have any sense at all, you can see, hey, it doesn't, it doesn't line up with the scriptures. God doesn't punish the righteous with the wicked. Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, verse 29 through 30. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Exactly like post-tribbers. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In the what? Resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. What is the catching up? What is the rapture, if you want to call it that? It's the resurrection. When the dead saints come up. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Remember that. That's going to be important. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The trump of God, the door in heaven. How could you miss it? Unless you're lost. My sheep hear my voice. I am the door. I call my own sheep by name and lead them out. Well, I just don't see it. That, that's because you're lost. <laughs> okay? Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He gets caught up. Hmm. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And you can come up with all these little arguments, all these little things. Well, what about, well, see, when he said, it, it, I've answered all of them. There's not one argument for the post-trib that I haven't answered in my sermons. No glory to me. It's just something that God placed in my heart. God called me into that and said, okay, you answer these devils, these wicked post-tribbers out there. Self-righteous fools that they are. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 through 14. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9, I believe it is, talks about the bounds, the boundaries, the 12 boundaries. God has set bounds according to the number of the children of Israel. 12. What is 12 times 2? 24. How many elders are we seeing here? 24. Don't give me this nonsense. Well, the, the 24 elders are the 12 apostles and 12 patriarchs. Then they'd all be Jews. It's two from each of the 12 boundaries. It's crystal clear. They're bought by the blood. You see? And they're in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. Verse 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth reigning with Jesus Christ for the thousand-year kingdom. That's promised to Christians. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. What are these people doing in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed? And they're crowned? Been through the judgment seat of Christ? 
You say, well, that's only 24. Where's the rest? Okay. Verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Huh. A number just over 100 million. Truly born again saints. In the last approximately 2,000 years. A little less than 2,000 years. Not that many. Body of Christ is a lot smaller than you'd think. Kind of like what Jesus said, you know. Okay, the broad road which leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But the narrow way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. The vast majority are lost. But what did Jesus Christ say there in Matthew chapter 22? In the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Who are these uh, just over 100 million here? Many angels. The Christians. Resurrected saints. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are, all that are in them, Heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth <clears throat> upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. We're caught up, what? To the praise of his glory. That's the next event for a Christian. Kind of a comfort, isn't it? No matter what you're going through. The headaches that never stop the sickness that you deal with, the people at work that hate your guts, the payments, bank payments, and whatever other things that you go through, and family turning against you, and people don't want to talk to you anymore, and you've been to different church buildings and whatever else, and they're all rotten and corrupt and whatever else, and you, and you get accused of things, oh, you're a church hopper, you're, you're a troublemaker, you're a rebel, you know, all this other stuff. You get sick of it after a while. But you know what? We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. And we're going to get there and we're going to praise him. That's a comfort. You say, well, I don't believe that way. Then you're lost. <laughs> you're just as simple. It's just as simple as that. You're not believing in Jesus Christ. You're believing in the Antichrist. You believe in a false Christ if you are a post tribber Verse chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And there you go. 24 elders, and over 100 million, 100 million and thousands of thousands, angels, redeemed saints, in heaven, before the Antichrist is unleashed. Argument's over. It's over. You say, well, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm still post-trib. Then you're going to go to hell. This is as simple as that. Death and hell are one of the horses. The pale horse. And you're going to go through that as a Christian? God's going to unleash death and hell on you? Hmm. You know, I realize that there are people that say, well, what if somebody just newly got saved and they just, you know, kind of fallen for some of this stuff, whatever? Uh, then you better change real quickly. Um, because if you just continue with it and continue with it and continue with it, uh, then I have to say you're lost. You haven't really put your faith in Jesus Christ. You believe in a Christ that saves you from hell, but doesn't save you from hell on earth. How does that make any sense? It doesn't. Uh, the time for grace is gone, brethren. Okay? The time for wishy-washy, uh, I don't want to offend people, that's gone. It's over. Okay? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Don't be one of them. So I believe the King James Bible. Okay, then take your stands for it. Oh, well, I, I, can, I think we can just agree to disagree. No scripture for that. None. The Bible never says that. So... I'm going to put some links to the end at the end here for the sermons on the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the catching up before that. Uh, if you're new to the whole thing and you really don't know any better or whatever else, okay, fine. Do some study. Do some research. 
And if you come out at the end still saying I'm post-trib, then you're going to end up in hell. <laughs> Just as simple as that. You're not looking for the resurrection. You're not looking for Jesus Christ. You're looking for the Antichrist. Next event for me is I get to go up to be with the Lord. And if I die before that, then I go up first. <laughs> resurrection. And I want to get to see the uh, saints that have gone on before me. I want to get to see the Apostle Paul. I want to get to see John and, and James and Peter and, and all the, the great men down through the centuries, all the Christians that have ever lived. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to praising Jesus Christ together with all my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a comfort. That's going to be it. I pray you take heed to these things. Yeah.